On This Week in Enterprise Tech, Municipal Broadband makes the stage. Cisco's brand new wireless products. Oh, and uh, IDIS Networks is here to tell you all about deep packet inspection. Twyant on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twyant. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 127, recorded February 2nd, 2015. Deep Packets with Idis Networks. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by LDProducts.com, the ink and toner experts. Shop online at LDProducts.com for high quality products at discount prices. For 10% off ink and toner cartridges plus free shipping, excluding OEM, go to LDProducts.com slash twit and enter the offer code twit. And by HipChat, collaborate, save time, and be more productive with your teams. HipChat is IM video chat plus file, code, and screen sharing all in one place. Invite your team members and get a free 30-day trial at hipchat.com slash twyant. And by ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter makes hiring faster, easier, and cheaper. Post your job to 50-plus job boards with one click. Try ZipRecruiter.com with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash Twyant. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Twyant. Welcome to Twyant This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know... How the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Pallas here, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But as always, I've got my regular cast of characters, starting with Mr. Brian Chi, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. Brian, good to have you back, sir. Hey, it's all good. And I keep hoping I'm actually going to play catch up someday. My, I'm up to a 12, 13 hour work day. Whoa. Well, now, uh, you, by the way, you will never get cat caught up. That's just not how it works. Uh, and a man who understands that is Mr. Curtis Franklin from Information Week Radio. Curtis, it's good to see you on the other side of the United States. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well, Padre. It's uh, good to be back in the swamp after a pleasant week out in the Bay Area, including my first ever visit to the Brick House. So uh, it, it's good to be back home, but already looking forward to the next time I can get out there. Well, gentlemen, it's going to be an absolutely packed show. We're going to be talking about Cisco's new tech, the death of perimeter security, and more. But first, let's go ahead and start with the blips. This one is all about DDoS being the new black. The numbers on DDoS attacks are in, and it doesn't look good. Akamai Technologies reported last week that they saw a 57% increase in the number of DDoS attacks year over year in quarter four, 2014. This was accompanied by a 52% increase in the average peak bandwidth of those attacks, mainly because of NTP and DNS amplification attacks. What does it all mean? Well, it has become trivial to launch a DDoS attack with enough packets behind it to take down even the largest pipes and most distributed networks. If you throw in a survey of ISPs who agreed that the largest DDoS attacks today are 50 times the size that they were 10 years ago, this is a trend that our bandwidth can't win. Well, another trend's Windows 10 Enterprise support picture has cleared up, but only a little. A lot has been made of Microsoft's ability to push updates straight to users with no intervention in the cloudy future of Windows 10. But what about enterprise users who don't want someone from Redmond automatically changing their, well, anything? The answers started coming in last week, and it's all about the branches. There are current service branches that are automatically updated, Microsoft recommends that systems that aren't mission critical go onto this branch. Then there are the long-term service branches where IT is responsible for downloading and applying updates. Now, notice that I use the plural for both branches. That's because there are multiple flavors of each, depending on just which Microsoft Enterprise licensing plan you're currently under. And here's something else that's important to remember. You know the whole free update from Win 7 or 8 to Windows 10? Now, uh, that doesn't apply to any enterprise customers. Sorry, you have to see your licensing agreement for details on how or whether 
the update's going to happen. Bummer, dude. Your Beamer just got hacked. According to a Slash Gear article, it seems there's been a vulnerability in Rolls-Royce Mini and BMW vehicle infotainment systems that allows someone to remotely unlock the vehicle in minutes. The over-the-air patch seems to have affected upwards of 2.2 million vehicles. Oops. Is Amazon rich, broke, or somewhere in between? We all know that Amazon Web Services are big. They're fast, powerful, and available for pennies on the processor, but those watching the growth of cloud services have always been a bit stymied by the fact that Amazon doesn't let the world know how much they make on those cloud services. At least, not yet. Last week, Amazon CFO Tom Skutak announced that the company will be breaking out the financial details of Amazon Web Services beginning in quarter two, 2015. Gardner and other analysts have speculated that Amazon's web services may be bigger than all its competitors combined. So it will be nice to see exactly how big big is. Hey, want some windows with that pie? Enterprise developers have long searched for the perfect embedded controller. You know, the one that's low cost, powerful, and part of the enterprise ecosystem. Welcome to Raspberry Pi 2. The newest version of the tiny Linux powerhouse is six times faster than its predecessor, contains much more memory, and has a surprise waiting for enterprise users. Though it comes with Raspbian Linux as its native OS, an embedded version of Windows 10 will be available for the Raspberry Pi 2. Now, you won't be able to run Word on the dirt cheap system, but you will be able to develop apps that use the command line Internet of Things version of the latest Windows, and you'll be able to tie those things together with the Windows Enterprise backend. It's starting to sound like this particular rev of Raspberry Pi might just be fully baked. Whoopee! Google Earth Pro just got discounted to free. The real difference comes down to resolution and being able to import or export high-res images instead of just screen resolution. It also lets you save animated movies of your cruising. It doesn't sound like much until you closely watch your local news report where they zoom in on the scene of a fire or crime using the Pro version. What the Slash Gear article doesn't mention is that the Pro version also has a dramatically richer set of APIs for manipulation, which I hope to use to generate walking directions at the University of Hawaii campus and display a QR code to transfer those directions to your phone. One last bit, and that's the FCC got paid. After two years of starts and stops and two and a half months of bidding, the auction for the AWS-3 Spectrum has closed, and the FCC is $44.9 billion richer. The AWS-3 Spectrum is actually paired Spectrum, which bonds two different frequencies for upload and download. 1755 to 1780 megahertz for the uplink, and 2155 to 2180 megahertz for the downlink. The $44.9 billion is by far the largest bounty the FCC has collected on GS65 megahertz of Spectrum, but it's for good reason. The frequencies that were auctioned are high enough to offer high bandwidth ca uh, capacity, but low enough that they will propagate over large areas with relatively few repeaters. Full disclosure of the terms of the auction are not yet available, but it's expected that AT&T and Verizon purchased the bulk of the available licenses. As for the cash, $7 billion will go into a national emergency communications network, $300 million will go into research for public safety communications. $115 million will be used to improve 911 services. $20 billion will be used to pay down some of the federal government's debt. And we're assuming that the rest will be used to fight off the inevitable lawsuits over FCC net neutrality policy. Now, when we come back, we're going to go ahead and do a deep dive on a couple of enterprise bites. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a pause to thank the first sponsor of the Twiat Riot. Now... If you work in an office today, you know that printing is the lifeblood of business. I don't care how paperless you think your office is. If you don't have paper, if you don't have ink, if you don't have toner, you just ain't doing business the right way. Some things just need to be in front of you. And so the question you have to ask yourself is, am I going to pay a lot and know very little about those supplies? Or am I going to get the experts over at LD? In today's paperless office, you've got those two choices. But... You can go to ldproducts.com and make it simple. You don't go to a car dealership to buy gas, so why go back to a printer manufacturer to buy ink and toner? That just doesn't make sense. LD Products offers a quality alternative at a fraction of the cost. Some products are up to 75% off of OEM. 
They've been in business for 15 years, since 1999, and they're a BizRate customer certified and Google trusted store, shipping over 1 million orders a year. And they get that you're not an ink or toner expert. In fact, they, they know that you're not. That's why they have real people who are experts and who will treat you with respect seven days a week from their U.S.-based call center. Uh, worried about getting the wrong product? I mean, I know that this is always a problem when I'm working in an office. People don't want to order an ink or toner cartridge if it might be the wrong thing. Well, don't worry about that. With LD products, all their products are risk-free with a two-year, 100% customer satisfaction guarantee. That means you can return any product for any reason. But LD isn't just about good prices, great service, and an excellent return policy. Buying LD brand cartridges helps the environment by keeping oil, plastics, and waste out of landfills. Plus, their call center, warehouse, and headquarters operate from a 110,000-square-foot platinum LEED-certified building right here in Long Beach, California. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to try LD products. They've got your printer needs covered, remanufactured, compatible, and brand name products. To get 10% off ink and toner plus free shipping, excluding OEM, go to ldproducts.com slash twit. That's ldproducts.com slash twit. And enter the offer code twit. And we thank LD Products for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Let's get back into it. The first story this week is, uh, well, it's about metadata. Now, we all know about metadata. And one of the maxims of the pro data sharing industry today is that metadata isn't personally identifying. That's, that's the whole thing. It's just a pointer towards trends rather than a way to identify individual users. It's supposed to make us feel better. For example, Google isn't collecting your data, just data in general so that they know what the trends are. Apple doesn't collect your location data, just location data in, in general so that they can detect densities. And financial companies don't look at your individual financial transactions. They just want to know where the money is being spent. Metadata is supposed to be the new anonymity. But as it turns out, that's bunk. We've got a report here from MIT. Researchers at MIT took a look at some typical metadata assets and have concluded that it's trivially easy to turn anonymous metadata back into identifiable users. Now, they were working with a commercially available coarse grain metadata set about the purchase prices of certain products. They found that just three data points were enough to identify more than 90% of the people in the data set. They were able to correlate the data even without name, address, credit card information, or other data fields that we would usually associate with personal information. And those three points could include a receipt, an Instagram photo, a tweet, status update, or other social networking post. Now, I, I want to throw this over to you first, Hubert. Are we surprised? Because every once in a while, one of these anonymity slash metadata stories comes out, and there's a little bit of an uproar, and then we forget. But if you've been watching Enterprise for a while, and if you've been watching Big Data for a while... Is this really all that surprising? No, I don't think so. You know, that's one of the th challenges of big data. How do you go and provide enough information for you to do business, but yet, you know, crank it down a little bit so that you don't deal with privacy issues? Uh, all the people that I've talked to that are dealing with big data, they really and truly don't want personal data in there. Um, it brings up all kinds of problems brings up people to get all mad at you and things like that. They want to be able to do business, but they don't want personal information, or at least the people I've talked to don't want it. But how clever are you? How how good is your big data? It Big data can do an awful lot of really interesting things. And uh, I think that's going to be the big privacy issue in this coming decade. Right, right. Curtis, let me go over to you. I mean, I, I think the first major study like this was when AOL released that big chunk of anonymized data, what was it, six to eight years ago? It was a long, long time ago. And back then they figured out that one of the things that people do in their search is they search for their own names. And so in that, in that instance, there was, there was a natural way for you to, to, to take a chunk of data and put it back on a user. What this new study does, much like the study that was done two years ago that showed metadata from cell phones could be used without any traditional personal identification markers, is to say, I can get information that seems completely disparate, that's jumbled up in a data set, and using 
certain algorithms and, and, and heuristical logic trees, I can pinpoint who this data belongs to, even if I don't have a number, an address, a name, or any financial information. It is, I mean, is, is that where we are right now? Well, I, I think that we're certainly getting close if we're not completely there, because let's face it, businesses have a lot of incentive to do this. Let's remember a term from about a decade ago, mass personalization. It's all about giving the customer what appears to be a very personalized experience. The corporations who are selling to customers know, because they've seen it again and again, that if they can make you feel like they know you, if they can make you feel like they understand what you want when you come in, that you're much more likely to buy from them. So if they can use this metadata to get a more complete picture of each customer, then it becomes much easier to tailor a message and a user experience for that customer. Now, on the one hand, that's not a bad thing. They're trying to meet the needs of the customer much more completely. On the other hand, a lot of people very naturally still want to control the interaction they have with a the company. They want to be in control rather than the company being in control. And for those consumers, this is a very, very troubling development indeed. That actually leads into my second question. And I want to throw this one to you first, Curtis, because you, you've already started talking about it. There are obvious implications here for government surveillance or surveillance by third parties who just want to track certain individuals. We, we've known for a while that you can take metadata and reverse it to figure out who it is. It doesn't matter that you've anonymized it at some level. But there's always a question of whether or not the enterprise actually wants that. The, 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 the larger networks want that. The commercial networks want that. It's, as you said, it's nice to be able to personalize your sales pitch because that increases the chance that that pitch will actually work. But do enterprise networks actually want the liability of being able to correlate certain purchases and activities online back to individuals? Well, you're assuming that a legal liability exists for doing that. Uh, in the U.S., I'm not at all certain that it does. Now, Europe is a, a different ball of wax. I don't completely understand all of the privacy laws in Europe. But here in North, North America, there really isn't a downside to doing this. Um, when you look at retailers in certain areas, and I'm thinking specifically of very large retailers like Amazon, like eBay, and even like, say, a Walmart, uh, who has a significant online presence. When you think about key hospitality companies, and here in particular, think about companies like MGM Grand, Harrah's, and, and organizations like that. They have some very powerful financial incentives to co understand the customer as completely as possible because, as I said, they know from their own research that the more they tailor an offering and tailor an experience to an individual customer, the more that customer is likely to spend with them. The liability for the data that's put together pales in comparison to the additional revenue that can be generated by those customers. Um, and once again, it comes down to a question of who owns the data. And they can say very reasonably, that each company that collected the data, and that's usually where the relationship and any contract or user agreement sits, has fulfilled all of their responsibilities to the customer. It's in doing things with what is literally anonymized data that things get really interesting. So, so we're in very much a legal gray area because each participant along the chain has fulfilled their obligation legally to the customer until you get to someone who may not have any legal relationship with the customer whatsoever. And legally, they can, I suspect, do pretty much what they want. We'll get back to the dead horse of privacy later on. But right now, I do want to move on to the next story. And that is 
what exactly would a free and open municipal broadband system look like? Now, in his State of the Union address, President Obama publicly opposed any state restriction on municipal broadband initiatives. Basically, he represented the growing tide of people living in broadband underserved areas who are tired of having their hands tied by state restrictions against municipal networks at the same time that the incumbents refuse to build out their networks. Well, the State of the Union address may have opened up the tap on local governance frustration. 38 mayors and officials have asked the FCC to strike down those very state restrictions on municipal broadband. They call themselves the Next Century Cities Group, and it's comprised of elected officials from Boston, Seattle, Kansas, and other municipalities, which currently cannot explore the build-out of city-owned networks for high-speed internet. Their statement, and I quote, is to say, It is increasingly clear that ultra-fast next-generation internet networks are the key to building and sustaining thriving communities, as essential as good health care, great schools, and reliable public safety. Chibert, I, I want to throw this over to you. We hear this every once in a while, this idea of municipal broadband, the, the rollout of a local community of a network because AT&T or Verizon doesn't actually want to come in and spend the money to build out that infrastructure. But what's keeping that from happening? Let's clear that up first. Why can't a city in somewhere, Iowa, just decide we're going to lay fiber in our streets and deliver service to our citizens? It's all about the lobby you know, we've got lots and lots of people that make lots and lots of money that spent insane amounts of money to put in poles and conduits. They don't want a municipality eating into that. They want to be able to stretch out that investment as far as they possibly can. And I saw this exact problem happen when the deregulation of the Interlata um, tariff structure got put in place. The telephone company had to fight it. You know, it was their fiduciary duty to their stockholders. And as a result, you know, the knee-jerk reaction is fight it. I think it will actually make more sense later. Um, my personal opinion is municipal broadband will actually help drive business. And the municipal broadband is going to be more for the Joe Friday. You know, it's, it's going to be good. It's going to be one can hope it'll be great, but it's not going to be something you're going to bet a corporation on. So like the deregulation of the Interlata uh, telephony business, I think by putting in broadband like this, you're going to start opening up a whole new section of business that didn't previously exist. Just look at what Google Fiber did to Kansas City. All of a sudden, people are now moving their operations to Kansas City in order to take advantage of Google Fiber wonder what's going to happen if all of a sudden ubiquitous broadband was available everywhere in a city. Sure goes a long way to making it a better place to live and maybe a better place to work. You know, it's interesting. One of the counter arguments I hear a lot is exactly how expensive it would be to do municipal uh, broadband, a, a nationalized program for municipal broadband, letting every community build out the way that they need to build out to support the citizens in that community. In fact, the FCC was recently quoted in saying that looking through the areas that would have to be built out, it would it would cost somewhere in the vicinity of 100 to 180 billion dollars just to get the basic fiber in so that you could build out those those localities, which sounds like a lot of money. It sounds like a ton of money until you realize that we actually gave the telcos over 200 billion dollars in tax relief and incentives after the uh, the uh, Telecommunications Act to do exactly that. And they didn't. So essentially what people are saying was, we already paid for it. We didn't get it. So we might as well buy it ourselves. Uh, let me ask you, Curtis, if this starts becoming a movement and if more and more cities get on the bandwagon to remove those restrictions so that they can build out their cities, cities that are underserved, what would it look like? What would they need in order to be able to build out those municipal, municipal broadband networks? Well, I think that the, the answer to that varies from community to community, but the two big things they need are some sort of last mile connectivity, and that can usually be gotten, uh, you know, leased uh, on a on a colo basis with incumbents or pulled uh, if you're in a community like mine where you've already got uh, the municipality running some of the utilities. The big issue for a lot of these communities and a lot of places that are excited about this, frankly, is the backhaul. 
Uh, I've been talking to a couple of school districts lately who went in and did really great things in terms of connectivity between the schools themselves and found that they just created a bottleneck one level up. Um, you know, if we give people, you know, we've just had the proposed um, or the, the actual redefinition of broadband to be uh, 25 meg down, uh, all of a sudden you start needing some, some truly fat pipes coming out the back end of that in order to make everyone happy. Uh, and if you've got a lot of these municipalities where if you look carefully at their infrastructure, they have a pair of OC3s going upstream, um, that's where the real money and furthermore, the ongoing money lies. Uh, and frankly, that's the piece I don't think uh, enough people are talking about. Everybody's getting uh, wrapped around the axle of the last mile. That may well be the easy part of this entire puzzle to solve. Right. Chibert, I, I want to throw one last bit into the mix here. The rationale that this uh, the Future Cities group gave, that it's increasingly clear that ultra-fast next-generation Internet is, is a prerequisite for participating in today's society, is a lot like the reasoning that we heard from FCC uh, Tom Wheeler this morning when he announced that the FCC was ag again going to try to tackle net neutrality. He said basically the same thing, that we need to start looking at the Internet the same way that we look at water or power. In other words, it's a utility. It's something that everybody needs in order to be able to participate in society. Is this the new way that we go about talking about net neutrality, national rollout of municipal broadband at all? You know, this is one of the cases where I'm not sure I want to go one side or the other. I'm still sitting on the fence post. There's a lot of good things in both camps, a lot of good arguments. And, you know, on one hand, the, the carriers need to make money, otherwise they can't afford to reinvest in their networks. But having something like a municipality network means that there's going to be less of a digital divide. Um, when you start looking at what's being done in a lot of third world nations, a lot of that effort's being concentrated around things like water, power and internet and so both have really good things i'm not sure if we can have our cake and eat it too i would like to think we could but you know net neutrality doesn't necessarily mean uh ubiquitous ethernet for every you know ubiquitous broadband for everyone but i think the digital divide is going to be more more of a driving force all right, gentlemen, I want to step away from any sort of politics before it gets too heated here. In fact, let's just move on to some hardcore, geeky network hardware. Now, we covered this last week in a blip, but I think it deserves more of a bite. That's about Cisco's multi-gigabit technology. I think it may actually be their next big killer networking feature. This is from the Cisco blog. Now, we all talk about the arrival of Wave 2 802.11ac gear. But uh, that has some ramifications for people who run networks. Uh, Cisco's 3850 and 3650 stackable switches were introduced back in 2013, and they allowed for combining wired and wireless uh, traffic into a single backplane. Now, they introduced the 4500E in 2014, last year, which advanced the converged access methodology so that you start thinking of your wired and your wireless as the same thing. And, and most of the network providers have moved into this, this format. But now Cisco is putting a problem that all network admins will be facing in the next year to the forefront. And that is, what do I do when my wireless access points need more bandwidth than my existing switches can provide? Again, this is important because those Wave 2 of 802.11 AC devices are coming. And those APs can put out up to 7 gigabits per second of connection. Now, if you're using a 3850, 3650, or 4500 series switch, you can upgrade them using the stacking or the backplane uh, options uh, to provide 1, 2.5, 5, or 10 gigabits per second of throughput per port. And, and this is the big one, you can use your existing Cat 5E or Cat 6 copper. Chibert, let me throw this over to you first. How big is this? Because you know, we've been running interrupt for a while, and one of the things is that the APs have always been able to deliver less than one gigabit. Or, in a case like the Xeris arrays, which can deliver multiple gigabits, you have multiple Ethernet connections that get bonded together. 
do we need this? Is this is this a killer networking technology that Cisco can push out and say, you've already got the tech, you've already got the back uh, backplane, you've already got the the uh, copper and and fiber plant, just upgrade this way and you're good to go. You know, this has always been the case of why? Wow, why do we really need this? It's, it starts getting into the question should be more about what is your real density? You don't need these giant pipes on Wi-Fi if you don't have high density. Now, working at an academic institution, one of the things that we've noticed a lot is in high density areas like large lecture halls or the dining commons is where I can see the Wi-Fi APs tipping over on a really regular basis. It's to the point where I can't even get reliable connectivity. So on one hand, yeah, this is going to be really great. I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. That's, they say it'll run over standard copper. I'm wondering, you know, what kind of distances are we talking about and how are we going to manage this? Because one of the things I've seen a lot of people not do is they haven't been super aggressive on how they um, manage their Wi-Fi infrastructure. It's more of, oh, yeah, it's a screen in the knock, but is someone really watching it? So, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting, but it's going to bring a whole bunch of new problems for, for things like monitoring, uh, DDoS attacks, and things like that. I think management is going to be a bigger key than the actual bandwidth. Now, uh, Curtis, let me throw over to you again because I, I want the executive angle here. One of the maxims, and we've all heard it, is that no one ever got fired for buying Cisco. That used to be incredibly true. And then it started being not as much true. As some of the other networking uh, providers caught up, you started seeing some features that Cisco didn't provide or you started seeing interoperability that Cisco didn't want that became attractive. And so even though the Cisco pie is huge, I mean, it is by far the largest player, You've got some solutions from HP and Juniper and others that start to look really, really good. With this announcement, I could see this as something in a, 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 a boardroom meeting with, with your CFO and your CTO saying, oh, well, now there's really no reason for us to switch away from Cisco. Because we were looking at maybe doing a forklift upgrade and moving over to switches from HP. But if Cisco can now support the new generation of wireless APs and we don't have to change our physical plant, we don't have to change our switching backplane, we don't even have to change the way that we, we wire our network, we connect our network, that becomes the next no one ever got fired for buying Cisco wireless. Well, true. It, it, no one ever got fired for buy, buying Cisco and it gives people another reason not to go through that major pain of a forklift upgrade, uh, especially a forklift upgrade that involves learning new management tools. Um, to me, I, I absolutely agree, first of all, with, with Chiebert. This is one of those things where the management is critical and the application is critical. If you've got uh, even a moderately sized business with um, employees relatively spread out, this isn't critical for you. Mm. If, on the other hand, you regularly bring people together in large meetings, if you are uh, someone who runs a convention center uh, or a conference center, or to get back to our last story, if you are a municipality that has free Wi-Fi, and let's admit it, the number of municipalities who have Wi-Fi is far greater than the number who have broadband, then you start talking about the densities where this is absolutely critical. And so I think for Cisco, what it does isn't so much make it hard for all of their customers to switch away, but it makes it much easier for their key customers to put thoughts of switching to the side. Well, gentlemen, that's the end of the Enterprise Bytes. Now, when we come back, we're going to be bringing Daniel Ayub from IDIS Networks. You may remember he was on a while back talking about the Guardian, the iGuardian. It was a device that allowed you to get some serious enterprise class defense in your home or SMB office. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the second sponsor of the Twyat Riot, and it's HipChat. Now, I know you're all about communication. In fact, that's what this show is about. In fact, that's what most of the shows on the Twit TV network are all about. Our in-office communications have been around forever, and sometimes we get a little sick of hearing about the next new tool or the next new suite. We've already got email, phone, voicemail, IM messaging. What else do you possibly need? 
Well, there's a wrinkle to that, and that is if you run a business. Because even though all those communication tools are great, you really want something that pulls them all together to give you not just one easy place to communicate with your team, but also an interface that lets you go back through time to look at the genesis of an idea or what happened in a group conversation or what was the next piece of mission critical update that you needed to do. That's what you get with you when you've got hip chat. If you work in a team, you need that communication suite that won't just connect you, but will allow you to pick up a conversation where you left off. You need a communication tool that's designed specifically for business. Now, HipChat is IM, video chat, document sharing, screen sharing, system updates, and code sharing integrated into a single, simple platform. Email is too slow, meetings get sidetracked, and regular IM doesn't really work all that well for groups. But HipChat keeps your team in sync, and it works from any device, no matter where you are. Best part, HipChat integrates with the top developer, developer tools like GitHub, Jira, Zendesk, and more. You can go to their website and check out the 57 services that HipChat plays nice with. It brings your entire project and team communications together. It's easy to use. It's, it's very easy to set up. It's fun to make sure that you're always in communication with your team members, and it makes that team wildly productive. Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to try hip chat. Get your team on the same page in seconds. I want you to try them for free. No credit card required. Visit hipchat.com slash twiet. Click on the start chatting settings to uh, start, start chatting to sign up. Then invite a few team members and all the features are free for 30 days. After the free trial, you can always stick with the freemium version. And remember, that's hipchat.com slash twiet. And for the first 100 signups, HipChat is going to extend their 30-day free trial to 90 days. HipChat, your team, your project, in sync, instantly. And we thank HipChat for the support of this week in enterprise tech. Let's get to it. We welcome back to the show Mr. Daniel Ayu from IDIS Networks. Daniel, thank you very much for coming back on to this week in enterprise tech. Hi, Padre. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be here. Now, when last we saw you, uh, because you've been on the show actually quite a bit over our two-plus year run, uh, you used to be at SonicWall. You were an engineer with SonicWall. You were showing off some super high-end enterprise-class firewalls. Then you moved to a startup. You created a startup called IDIS Networks. What, again, could you remind us what IDIS Networks does? Sure. So we basically took that same class of enterprise-grade internet security that you'd find uh, in you know millions of businesses around the world and we simplified it and brought it down to the consumer level so that it's literally plug and play and uh, provides you with that same level of security at a fraction of the price. Oh, you are doing a startup that is aimed at the individual. Uh, for example, I, I uh, supported you on Kickstarter because I need one for my parents. I'm going to drop it into the home network because I need the peace of mind that they're, they're not being exploited. Uh, but your background is the enterprise, and that's where I want to tap your knowledge today, specifically in this topic that we've been talking about for a while, since, since Twiat actually started, and that is the death of premise security. Really quickly, could you, could you tell the audience uh, who's playing along at home, what do we mean whenever we talk about the traditional model of premise security? Yeah, so traditionally things were typically done where you had a uh, hard shell exterior and a, and a crunchy or a, a smooth, chewy interior. So the outside uh, perimeter would be hardened and defended very well. Uh, but once you got on the inside of the network, the general thought was that people that are on the inside are trusted and can kind of move around and do what they want without too much uh, interruption or inspection. So it's really kind of taking the security at the edge as opposed to every step along the way. Right. I, I remember when uh, I, I tried to describe this once to a, a group of uh, uh, new engineers, and I, I was saying, like, it's like an onion. And so, of course, the, at the very outer layer is the hardest to get through. It's the hardest to penetrate. But as you get closer to the center, there's more explicit trust. You can now have access to everything. I, and that's changing now, right? When we talk about the death of the perimeter security model, we now move to more of a, a trust no one model. And what does that mean? Yeah, so I'd say probably for about the last two years or so, there's kind of been this notion, going back to Black Hat about two years ago, um, they kind of came out with this notion that you should just assume people are already on the inside of your network. If you run an enterprise uh, network, you're responsible for the security, just assume that the bad guys have already gotten in and start looking for them and look for ways to cut them off or implement additional barriers that they'd have to go through to be able to exfiltrate data or get into various systems. So 
um, kind of taking the notion of, yeah, we're, we're going to defend the perimeter, but let's also assume that the bad guys are already inside, and what can we do to stop them if they are? Right. Um, and that's kind of been more of the approach, I'd say, over the last 18 to 24 months. Uh, I actually, I want to bring in one of my co-hosts here, uh, Chibert. Let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, you're, you're a big fan of putting your security into zones. So people in zones have access to that zones, and then they have explicitly defined permissions on where they can and can, cannot go in that network. What does it mean to you who has to support a very complicated network with a lot of very sensitive data, with a lot of people who need to end up in different zones like a campus network at the University of Hawaii. What does it mean to you that we're moving away from premise security? Well, it's not so much, I'm, I, yes, I am a big fan of zones, but it's more, I'm a fan of making sure that there are multiple points within my network that I can actually do deep packet inspection so that I don't really have to trust because we've got, faculty, student staff and faculty coming around with laptops that are bringing viruses into the network. In fact, that's the reason why almost, I think, four or five years ago when I did my first firewall bake-off for InfoWorld, that I forced the vendors to be able to be attacked from both inside and outside. I ran the attacks both ways. Now, taking that a little further and saying I'm going to run an attack across multiple zones is not a big stretch. Um, so I've been a big um, supporter of going to let's not trust anyone. Let's not just trust the hard, crunchy exterior. Let's go and make sure we're looking at the possibility of infections and malware and attacks coming from the inside. And um, that's one of the things that a lot of people aren't doing. They're, they're trying to trust um, the firewall. You know, firewall is giving them a really bad false sense of security, and that's one of the reasons why I really hated those El Cheapos that you buy from, you know, the brick and mortar stores. I want people to start using something that's actually going to look and expect intrusions from the inside, and that's why I've also, um, I think I've got three units on on Kickstarter with <laughs> Daniel because I want them bad. I really do. Uh, Curtis, actually, let me let me put you in here a little bit because, again, I want the executive approach to this. Uh, for the longest time, CEOs and CFOs were told, you get this firewall and it will keep the baddies out. That was very easy to visualize. You wanted the bad people on the outside of your network and inside the network is where they work. Moving to this new security model where there's no real perimeter. I mean, you still have the big firewall, but you just assume and you have to tell your executives assume that people in the network or something in the network has been compromised. People will do stupid things. There's a bot running that's going to be funneling out our data. How do you have that conversation and say, with all the millions of dollars we spent on security, we still need to be aware because we've probably already been penetrated? Here's the interesting thing. There are industries where because of the regulatory frameworks in place, you can't have that conversation with executives because the executives essentially have to represent in writing to the government and the regulators and their um, stakeholders, which are usually customers and partners, that this kind of successful intrusion can't happen. Now, those of us in IT, know that there really is no way to do that and, and be honest about it. So what you're seeing in a lot of heavily regulated industries are the conversations moving from the executive suite to the external law firms. You're seeing an awful lot of corporate law firms taking on the responsibility for having these conversations with the vendors and with the companies that will prepare them for an audit. The reason is that those external law firms can do so with client attorney privilege in place. The client attorney privilege has been shown not to exist with internal counsel. Regulations are making this a very, very tricky conversation to have. Um, and so 
it's fascinating being in a position where often executives are being forced by regulations to write checks for a security black box. And it's up to the external attorneys and their contractors to make sure that the executives don't end up in jail for doing that. Daniel, I want to go back over to you because as uh, high tech in the chat room jokingly said, it's the user who says, oh, yeah, do you mind if I plug in this infected USB drive? It, it, which is a joke, but that's true. That's what happens. And that's the whole you just assume that someone inside the network in a trusted zone has done something stupid. And that's why we need, as Chibert says, something like deep packet inspection. Now, uh, most of our audience knows what that is. But again, for those playing along at home, can, can you explain what deep packet inspection means and why was it that for the longest time you would only find it in super high-end enterprise firewalls? Sure. So um, if you take a look at the OSI uh, model and you look at the seven layers of the OSI model, typically with uh, standard firewalls, we call them stateful packet inspection. And what those are doing is looking at layers two, three, and four. So looking at the MAC address, the IP address, maybe some of the session connection information as the, the session is being established. But once that session is established, unless there is something blocking that port or blocking that IP address or there's a rule in the firewall saying, you know, don't allow this connection to go through, once that connection is established, it's trusted. It's, it's allowed the traffic that's coming in and going on, uh, going through there is no longer inspected. They only look at the headers of the packets when the session is established not at the actual payload of the contents. Now, when you talk about deep packet inspection, that's moving up the chain a little bit in the OSI model. So now you're looking at layers five, six, and seven. You're actually looking at the contents of the payloads, not just the headers, not just the addresses, but what's actually inside of the packets, the actual data there. So that's when you can find the exploits. That's where you can find the malware. Um, traditional firewalls that were only looking at the address and the labels on the headers uh, we're not actually able to catch any of that stuff. So if you, for example, uh, got a bad link and you clicked on it, uh, well, that session was started from the trusted side of the network and you clicked the link and it was established going out, the connection was permitted because it was permissible traffic, but now that exploit or that virus that's coming back in, there's nothing there to check it. With DPI or deep packet inspection, you're actually able to inspect that and then say, hey, wait a second, yes, the session is allowed, but the contents of this data we shouldn't be allowing it into the network. And, and that's kind of the difference. It's for the longest time, I'd say probably the biggest barrier and part of the reason that you only found it in those really expensive high-end firewalls is it's extremely processor intensive and requires a lot of CPU and a lot of RAM. If you think about you know tens of thousands of packets per second flying through a network, to be able to do that on the fly and look at the actual payloads and connect the dots between, you know, multiple packets for a single file, uh, that's, a, uh, that's pretty processor intensive. And that's part of the reason why you haven't seen it uh, in the lower end devices uh, before, you know, even up until now. That's, yeah, if you take a look at most of the home and SMB routers and slash firewalls, the, really all they're doing is they're just forwarding based on headers. And, and, and as you mentioned, actually going into the packet to look at the payload and scan the payload, looking for things that may be malicious, it is infinitely more conflict, uh, complex than just forwarding on a packet based on what it sees in the header. Which is why I, I'm going to talk about the uh, the uh, IDIS device here, the Guardian. It actually uses a uh, is it a ca cave cavium or a cavium processor, right? It's the same processor that you find in super high-end enterprise class firewalls designed for millions of concurrent sessions. And you've, you've used a, a, a slightly slower version uh, with fewer cores in your, your home box. Can you show us the home box? Sure. So uh, I've got one of the uh, mechanical device or samples right here. So this is what our beta units will look like. Uh, and you can see it's, it's a pretty small device, fits in the palm of your hand. But as you mentioned, this is running uh, some pretty high-end enterprise grade network security processors in here. Now, the difference between the chips that are in this box versus, let's say, a $100,000 firewall that you might buy from somebody like a, a Juniper or you know some of the other big players in that industry, um, the difference might be that they're using a 24 core or a 48 core, whereas we're using the dual core version of that uh, same processor. So um, the real magic happens in not just the CPU, but the CPU actually has a 
a special offloading engine that it uses for uh, regular expression matching and being able to do very, very fast pattern matching on those actual packet contents. Uh, and that's kind of the difference between you know, a cheap run-of-the-mill ARM processor that you might find uh, in you know, an off-the-shelf consumer wireless router versus you know, something that's really designed for security and packet inspection like the, uh, the Shield box that we have here. I, I want to talk a little bit about IPS IDS, intrusion prevention, intrusion detection. There's, uh, there's been a lot of renewed conversation about proper IPS and, and IDS after the Sony hack, especially since that hack ran for so long being undetected and got so much data. What's the, what are the best practices for having an IPS IDS box? Because I, I'll go back to Curtis's comment here, that whole idea of here's, here's a check, get me my security, and you buy a black box. Every enterprise, including Sony, has probably spent millions of dollars getting IPS IDS, but then they don't pay attention to what they're getting from those boxes and bad things happen. So what are the best practices? Um, so I think one of the big problems I think you find in, in larger networks especially is just the amount of data that comes off of the IPS, being able to manage the logs and sift through them and correlate events becomes extremely difficult. Um, also, when you talk about things like stolen credentials, where somebody actually stole uh, the username and password of an authorized user and then logged into the network that way uh, remotely, that's not really going to be caught by an IDS, IPS, unless you're doing some of the more advanced things that we're starting to see today with um, you know, correlation based upon geography and things like that. Some of the newer generation IPS, I think, are starting to take a lot of that big data analytics that you were mentioning previously uh, in the segment, and uh, they're starting to incorporate a lot of that kind of capability into the box to kind of connect the dots between not just the exploits, but as you mentioned, like in the Sony hack, there was like a terabyte of data that was exfiltrated out of the network, right? There should be some kind of anomaly, some sort of tripwire that gets set off that says, hey, wait a second, we're seeing a lot of data go to sources or destinations that we didn't have a month ago or a week ago or, or however it is. So there's, there's still um, a lot that needs to be done, I think, on the individual uh, company level, right, in, in terms of being able to how they manage it. And that, that's the big problem I see right now is just being able to manage the devices, being able to connect all the dots. You can put all these devices in the endpoint, but if they're not getting updated regularly, if people aren't reviewing the logs, if there isn't something there that's kind of looking at the big picture and connecting all the dots, uh, it's very easy to miss things in the, you know, you miss the, the trees in the forest, so to speak, or, or something like this. Yeah, it's the old uh, network tool overlord, uh, overload. Uh, and Chibert, actually, I want to ask you a little bit about that in just a bit, but before we continue on with talking about IDS, IPS, uh, deep packet inspection, and, and all the fun security things. Let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the third sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and it's ZipRecruiter. Now, these days hiring is more than just about finding the person with the right qualifications. There are a lot of people with the right qualifications, but the question is, are they the right person? Do they fit into your culture? Will they be the person for that position? Not just in skill set, but in temperament. Now, I've done my share of hiring, and the process was always the same. You post a job listing, you get candidates, you screen the candidates, and then you hire the best candidate, and then regret it half the time. The problem is that you need to cast as wide a net as possible to ensure that you are getting the best candidates. And then you need to put your posting in places where you'll find the candidates who are right for your position and your culture. That's why we're proud to have ZipRecruiter as part of the Twilight Riot. ZipRecruiter understands that posting your job in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates. If you want to find the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all the top job sites. And that's what ZipRecruiter does for you. With ZipRecruiter.com, you post your job once, and it gets placed on 50-plus job sites, including Craigslist, LinkedIn, and Twitter, all with a single click. ZipRecruiter will help you find candidates in any city or industry nationwide. Just post once and watch your qualified candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. There's going to be no juggling of emails or calls to your office. Instead, you'll quickly screen the candidates, rate them, and then hire the right person fast. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by over 250,000 businesses. Right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. For a free four-day trial, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash quiet. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash quiet. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Chibert, I said I was going to throw over to you. When we talk about 
IPS and IDS, as Daniel mentioned, often the problem is that there's not someone connecting the dots. There's not someone monitoring the logs to find out exactly what my tools are trying to tell me. And as Curtis said, a lot of times executives will just sign a check and say, okay, buy me security. We need something else, yeah? Oh, yeah, definitely. But I, I think I need to bring this back into perspective. The iGuardian is designed for the consumer, the work-at-home user, be able to reduce the attack surface so that the people that are VPNing in will be starting this whole process from a relatively clean network. Um, too many of the El Chipo firewalls don't have a full IDS IPS in there. And this is designed to actually go be between your cable modem or your DSL modem and your home firewall to add the IDS IPS capabilities to that you know, $60, $70 home router. Now, what I am going to do is I want to throw this to Daniel. Uh, Steve Gibson's in the chat room right now, and he asked a really great question on how do you handle the people where there's a lot of um, traffic now that's over TLS, HTTPS, SSL. Um, how does the iGuardian handle that kind of stuff? So the box itself is capable of doing SSL decryption. It's not something that we're going to be rolling out in the early phases, but uh, the web proxy system that's built in there for the content filtering is based on SQUID. So if you implement SSL bump, you can inspect SSL sessions. For a consumer environment, for like a typical home user, uh, when you start doing man in the middle on SSL sessions, it can get really messy really quickly, uh, especially if they're validating the certificate. So for example, um, certain devices you cannot install a certificate onto, like my Xbox, right? I can't install a trusted certificate onto it. So it may not be able to do a man in the middle on those types of connections. Again, uh, not something we'll have in the early launch stage, but it is something on the roadmap for future versions. And, and the code is already there to be able to do that uh, capability. Right, because this is essentially a Linux box onto which you're, you, can, you can install whatever packages you want. Yeah, so the underlying OS is uh, based on OpenWRT. And uh, there are a number of different packages that we've got running in there. So Snort for the IPS IDS. Uh, there's Squid, as I mentioned before, is kind of a web caching and web proxying system. Uh, and then there are plugins you can have for that to do content filtering, antivirus, things like that as well. Uh, right, quick, I actually, oh, I sorry, want to make ahead. a point though. The, the big point is the iGuardian is not only a turnkey product from all the testing that I've done so far, but it's also a platform. So that if you have someone that's savvy on Squid and things like that, you know, like Steve Gibson, Steve, now you have some really sexy processes to work with instead of the El Cheapos. It's almost like you're putting a full PC on there. The amount of CPU available to you is something that, you know, normally you'd have on a full PC, but you've got a platform that isn't going to cost you maybe an extra 20 bucks a month in power. Uh, I think that's actually a pretty big deal for the hobbyists that want to go and work with IDIS Net, um, uh, the IDIS guys to modify it. And I think, and one of the things I should point out, a lot of the front ends that um, Daniel's making is going to be donated back into the community, uh, which I think is absolutely stupendous and, you know, bravo. Yeah, yeah that's, that's actually a huge point, which is the community is going to be the one who develops a lot of the, the advanced features. So what IDIS is doing is they're giving you a box, uh, something on pawn you, which you can build. Out of the box, it works great for the consumer. It's going to work great for mom and dad. It's going to work great for those people who just want to make sure that massive amounts of data aren't being stolen from their home networks. But what you can do with it, because it's got so much horsepower, uh, that's, that's got me a little bit excited. Uh, uh, Daniel, I, I want to ask another question about this, and, and this was coming up in the chat room earlier, and that was, how does it deal with port obfuscation? We're hearing that a lot now, especially in concert with beacons and with DDoS attacks that are launched in order to do a, a surreptitious penetration of a network. So you launch a DDoS attack in a network, so they get occupied with the DDoS. And in the meantime, you're probing certain, certain ports and certain services, trying to get a toehold. And once you're in, you install an advanced persistent threat that uses port obfuscation to be able to do command and control and eventually to make away with a lot of data. So in that case, how, how would you stop it? How would the Guardian sure. be able to stop it? So um, 
The whole concept of deep packet inspection, if implemented appropriately, the ports should become neglig or negligible. The, the ports should become less critical than they are with stateful packet inspection, for example. So when you configure the IPS, like for Snort, for example, um, there are a number of preprocessors that it'll run the packets through. And you can basically tell it what services to look for on different ports. Now, now based on the amount of memory you have, you could basically put it so that it's looking for um, you know, the same service on every port. Typically, you're not going to do that just because it's going to have a pretty significant performance impact. But provided that you've got the box tuned and, and kind of dialed in appropriately, you can definitely set it so that you can look for, you know, uh, different types of traffic on non-standard ports. That's, that's definitely something that can be done there. Uh, and it's all basically done through the tuning of the IPS engine itself. All right. I, I want to ask, a, just step back a tiny bit. Because this all sounds great, and this is the kind of technology that I've wanted my home and my home office for a long, long time, uh, rather than just assuming that I've always been owned and reformatting my systems every couple of months. But when you're talking about this, I'm assuming that these features exist in super high, crazy expensive enterprise class firewalls. I mean, yes. I mean, if, if I buy the latest platform from SonicWall, which I love, I love their stuff. It's all high end. It all works incredibly well. I would get the same kind of protection or no? Um, yes and no, right? So the, the protection itself, the, the mechanism, the engine itself, uh, you're going to find probably there are going to be very much similarities between a lot of the different vendors that are out there. The difference will come in the actual signatures or the subscription, the feed that's going to that so that it's getting constantly updated intelligence to it. Um, that's going to be a big part of the differentiation between, you know, how the box actually blocks things. And it's also going to be dependent upon how the, uh, the appliance is tuned, whether it's tuned for an enterprise perimeter or whether it's tuned for a home environment, that kind of thing. So there's a little bit of, um, you know, you can kind of customize it, so to speak, um, but it's going to really depend on that. And, and the nice thing about our box is it's not tied to any one subs uh, subscription. So it comes with a free lifetime access to the community and the open source rule feeds. Uh, but if you want to add your own premium rule feed from like Sourcefire VRT or Emerging Threats or you know any uh, any other uh, service provider, you can basically just license those and, and put them onto the box the same way. Yeah, Daniel, uh, we do have to close up, but I, I this is actually a good question from the chat room, and there's a lot of people who watched IDIS Networks both on Know How and on This Week in Enterprise Tech when you first showed off uh, what it could do. Uh, and and uh, we've got Web six nine three six who said, look, I, I funded IDIS early in development. I'm just wondering. Well, what's the status on the units? Yeah, so we uh, we put regular updates on our Kickstarter page, but uh, we expect to be shipping uh, sometime in the, in uh, March will be when we actually start shipping out units. Right. I, I understand that there have been issues with getting fast prototype boards back and forth, which there are always those issues. So um, I'm still very excited for my unit. Gentlemen, thank you very much for participating in this. This has been a fun episode. We've been talking about a lot of things, everything from Cisco's networking hardware to deep packet inspection. Uh, this has been one hour of the best enterprise class podcast, according to nine out of 10 deeply inspected packets. I, I, I want to thank the members of the panel, starting with you, Daniel. If you could please tell the Twyte Wright where they can find you, where they can find IDIS Networks, and where... Of course, they could uh, buy a unit if they're looking to upgrade their home networks. Sure. So, uh, yeah, you can head on over. If, you're, uh, if you like what we're talking about, you think you definitely need this kind of security for your home, and I would definitely recommend it. I think there's uh, kind of a moving trend. You'll find more and more people are becoming more concerned with Internet security and having appropriate network security in your home, uh, especially for the, the enterprise guys and, and the, the Twyet crew. Um, the box is very flexible, as Padre mentioned. So if you're interested... Uh, head on over to itisnetworks.com. You can still pre-order today, and uh, you'll get one uh, along with the general fulfillment in March. And I believe we've already got an episode scheduled for uh, you to come back and actually demo it. So once it's shipping, so everyone can get their hands on it, we're going to have you back in the studio. We're going to hook it up so that everyone can see the interface. And uh, who knows, maybe we can get our friends from Mixia to, to run a couple of tests for us that would be nice all right uh of course i want to thank my co-host i couldn't do the show without them let's start with you chibert uh, what are you up to these days i am actually working really hard on 3d printer joy <laughs> Ooh. that's that's about 50 dollars of plastic right there i think no, right no no this is um 
about a quarter of a kilo. Oh, it's not bad. And a, yeah, a kilo is running. Well, if you buy it from MakerBot, it's like thirty-five bucks a kilo. If you buy it from Monoprice, it's half that. There we go. There we go. Uh, uh, actually, follow uh, Chibert if you want to find out uh, what he's doing with three D printer madness. We'll be doing some projects and know-how, so hopefully. We'll be able to have crossovers. I love crossovers, and this is one of the shows I haven't crossed over yet. Uh, Curtis Franklin, Information Week Radio. What's on your schedule, friend? Well, Padre, I was out uh, in the Bay Area last week doing interop net stuff, uh, getting ready for the big interop show coming up at uh, the end of April. Uh, looking forward to having everyone be part of that. Now, speaking of that, tomorrow on Interop Radio, we have... Uh, one of my favorite CIOs, the CIO of the city of Asheville, North Carolina, Jonathan Feldman, will be my guest. We're going to be talking about creativity from the CIO's suite. That's 3 p.m. Eastern time. Follow me on Twitter. Uh, the handle is right down there uh, if you want. Now, I have a request of the Twilight Riot. I'm working on a couple of things. So if you would, I'd like to see about your answer to two questions. One, what is it about IT that really excites you? What do you really care about in IT? The other is the notion of code schools. Have you taken classes at code schools or have you hired someone who learned how to code from one of the code schools out there? If, if you can answer any of these questions for me, I'd appreciate it if you drop me a tweet at KG4GWA or send email to curtis.franklin at ubm.com. Either way, I would really appreciate it. Gentlemen, thank you very much. We couldn't have Twyte without you. I also want to thank you. That's right, the person who comes back each week to watch This Week in Enterprise Tech. Without you, we wouldn't have a show. So we want to make it easier for you to get your enterprise goodness. Just go to our show page at twit.tv slash There you'll be able to find all of our back episodes along with, with uh, the show notes page so you can get links to individual stories. And you can also find the little drop-down menu. So if you want to subscribe to This Week in Enterprise Tech and get every episode into your device of choice, you can do it right there if you want it in your iPhone, your iPad, your Android, tablet, your laptop, desktop, Mac, PC. It doesn't matter. We're going to give you a link because we know you want your goodness. Also, you could follow me on Twitter. Just go to twitter.com slash Padre SJ. That's at Padre SJ. And you'll find out what I've been doing every week when I'm not on the show, including making the Leo Chopper. This is a great place to find out what I do on my shows and what I do in between my shows. Go ahead and follow me. That's twitter.com slash Padre SJ. Also, don't forget that we do this show live every week. Right now, we're doing it 2.30 p.m. Pacific on Monday. Starting in March, we're going to be moving over to 1 p.m. on Fridays. If you watch live, you can see the pre-show, the post-show, and everything in between. And as long as you're watching live, why not jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv. I pull questions straight from the chat room, so it's a great way for you to be part of the show. Finally, I want to thank everyone at Twit who makes this show possible. To Carson, my super producer. To Lisa, to Leo. And of course, to my magnificent, wonderful, handsome, just all-around good person, Brian Cranky Hippo Burnett. Of course, I gotta remember to turn on my mic during all those compliments. Uh, I was Cranky about Hippo, to mute oh. you. Well, where can they find you during the week? Because you're, uh, you're, you know, you're seen quite I'm often. I'm seen. I'm seen. I mean, you could probably find me in your Twitter feed. Uh, <laughs> we were reviewing a elect electric scooter earlier in the week. You're helping me videotape it, and then, uh, yeah, rubbed it in that I crashed it. But, that was like uh, 15 miles an hour, and that was, you know, you were wearing a helmet, though. So. I know how to roll. There you go. Uh, but you can find me at cranky underscore hippo on Twitter, and, uh, you know, occasionally I'll do BYB reviews if I have time, and then uh, later today, even, we're doing a know-how. So, uh, but you can normally watch that on Thursdays, you know, me and Padre. We goof around. We have fun. Tune in. Yeah, we do. A quick note to the audience. Uh, I'm actually heading out of town for two weeks. I have to do priest stuff. It's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. But that means that we're going to be doing a pre-recorded episode this Friday. We're actually going to be talking about offline data backup solutions. It's going to be fantastic. And next week, we're going to be talking about ShmooCon. So you're not going to want to miss it. That's right. Friday and Monday, you're getting a double dosing of Twyatt this week in Enterprise Tech. Wow, that sounds like penicillin. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balliser, the digital Jesuit, just reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet.